Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show episode, special episode here from the Gas Digital Network, where everything uh, started for this show, this major massive media operation started here in the bowels of the East Village at the Gas Digital studio under the tutelage of Luis Gomez, a major media figure. Like Robert Maxwell, Ghislaine Maxwell's father was a media mogul, Luis Gomez, media mogul. Uh, under his tutelage, I started the Tim Dillon Show massive media uh, operation, conglomerate, uh, as many have referred to it. Uh, and I can't run away from that anymore. People have accused me of being a powerful figure in the media, and I cannot run away from that anymore. It is... Facts are facts. I'm kidding, of course, am I? And uh, because I got into a skirmish, and I I didn't even mean to do this. I I tweet all day, every day, um, and uh, my tweets anger people to varying degrees. And uh, I was uh, with Ben, and we were driving back from Rochester, New York, and we were going to New York City. I didn't want to fly because it, it dries out my throat, even though my throat still sounds bad. Imagine how much worse it would have sounded had I flown. So it's a six-hour uh, drive, and that's a lot of uh, keyboard time, a lot of finger time for Twitter, um, including an hour stop at the Cheesecake Factory. Where? Do you remember? Uh, I don't know the name of that town. Oh, it's, oh it was outside Syracuse yeah. right there. And um, Cheesecake Factory outside of Syracuse, <laughs> New York. That was out of a lot of things. They were out of a lot of things, mm -hmm. but the things we had were good. The cheesesteak, uh, the cheese, uh, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, egg, egg, rolls, egg rolls, the quesadillas, one of the best mm -hmm. in the industry. Uh, and I tweeted about the sketch that SNL did uh, where Pete Davidson played Joe Rogan and somebody else played Big Bird. Uh, Kyle Mooney. Okay. And it was about, it's again, just kind of recycling this hack premise that Joe Rogan took horse medication for COVID, ivermectin, which isn't true. It's like a widely discredited thing, right? It's like a CNN talking point, like DNC talking point. It's weird that you wouldn't go further with it. We've made fun of Joe. We've made fun of Ivermectin. There's a lot to make fun of with podcasts, whatever. Alternative treatments. There's tons of things you can do. The sketch was admittedly uh, pretty lazy. And I think most people knew that. And I tweeted that. I said that. I said that the show now is kind of lazy, mediocre hacks. Not every sketch. Not everything they do. Certainly not everybody that works there, but you know when they go political, they they it's low hanging fruit. They're not trying to do anything that makes you go wow. Um, I mean, th this is a show that did the Mueller days of Christmas on the first day of Christmas. Bob Mueller gave to me. It, this is not. It's a propaganda arm, which is okay, right? You're allowed to be that. Comedy shows should have a point of view, and I don't have to agree with it. But when it's so blatantly uh, state propaganda, and it's so blatantly lazy, and and it's not executed well at all, people can criticize it. Like, that's, you know, something that's going to happen. And I criticize it. And then one of the writers, Michael Che, who I'd never had, we'd never had a negative interaction ever in our lives, um you know, came at me and was basically like, Tim Dillon's not what you think he is. He's a sweet, humble guy, which I agree with. And then he goes, he tried stand-up and got nowhere and... Um, became a media personality because it's much easier. Because Became a media personality because it's much easier. Um, which, again, is he's entitled to his opinion, right? I have a platform and an opinion, and people care about what I say. That tweet got like 40,000... Favorites and a bunch of retweets. So I listen. You know, I don't even know what the media is, but I guess anyone with a platform and an opinions in the media, um, 
it's not harder to be in the media. I mean, just this, let's say I am in the media. Let me take that premise. I don't know that I agree with that. He works for NBC. You would think if anyone was in the media, it, I, I, it's me and you here. I have nobody behind me at all. I'm except Lewis, maybe because he owns the <laughs> studio. But this idea that I'm a major media figure is kind of funny. Um, but again, I, am I known from the podcast? Sure. Is he known from SNL? Yes. Neither of us really are like Sebastian Maniscalco, who's known from stand up. Now we both do stand up, um, but and we're good at it. I think he's funny, and I don't know what he thinks I am. But we sell thousands of tickets all over the world, um, which he's not doing. But that's okay. Doesn't mean anything. It just means that there's people that enjoy my stand up, and. That's what it is. Now, maybe those people don't matter. That Maybe they're all Nazis. Who knows? That's possible. It's possible that everyone who's succeeding is a Nazi and all of their fan bases are Nazis. And that's the only reason that anyone is successful at all. Perhaps Doja Cat is a Nazi and everyone that buys tickets to her shows are Nazis. If you have a live event and it's sold over 70% of tickets, it's very possible Everyone there loves Hitler, I guess. I don't know. That seems to be the running explanation for why anyone is successful at anything. Um, and th that was his uh, uh, tweet. And then I think I, I tweeted back, um, you know, some, some things that I felt were true that are true. Um, and again, I don't even especially dislike Michael Che. I think he's smart in the sense that He's, you know, usually on the right side of issues. I think he understands comedy. He defends comedy a lot. He gets into arguments with some of the same people that I would get in an argument with. But, you know, I, I don't know where that came from. I can only imagine that, you know, he knows that that sketch wasn't great. What I said kind of got under his skin. Again, not meant to just an observation I was making. And he got mad at that and was like, Tim Dill's not what you think. He's not some truth teller. I don't know what even he thinks people think I am. The sketch wasn't good. <laughs> so if pointing out the sketch was good, uh, you know, makes me, I mean, then everybody, uh, whatever, every, I mean, you got to do that for everyone that saw the sketch. They're not what you think they are. This random guy is not what you think he is. There are people that are fans of SNL that went, that's not good. Um, and then I just kind of said, I said, listen, I, the, the reality is I sell more tickets than Che ever has. Um, he's not allowed to be on Twitter because of his job, which is true. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tag him or anything. Um, and then I said, I built something on my own that he never could. I, it is of my belief that he probably could not have. I don't know. Maybe he could have. Um, and then I said, you know, he's done well for a... Wait, what did I say? You said Che has done well for a drunk who can barely read, but his show sucks and he knows it. And that's true. And those are, you know, and that's great. And I, again, he's going to say, I'm not a comedian. I'm going to say things about him. It's kind of a petty, silly thing. Um, you, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to the fact that I angered some people over there, or maybe just him, with a tweet. That was a pretty innocuous observation compared to other things that I've said. Um, and hey, this idea that people that are succeeding on the internet are not comedians is an idea that is meant to um, justify the lack of success people are having in mainstream spaces. So when nobody on SNL or very few people on SNL can sell any tickets, excite anybody, uh, they're given shows, they're given budgets to do sketch shows that nobody watches. Um, none, of the, none of the sketches go viral, as many of our things have gone viral. They're not really a voice in the conversation that matters other than when they do the big show every Saturday night and they all come together and they make some noise and usually the noise is people going, God, this is bad. <laughs> That's usually why it gets any attention. Um, but individually that show is really not launching people into orbit anymore the way that it used to. 
and I've defended the show. It's probably the singular most important comedy platform uh, in America in terms of the amount of talented people that have come out of that show to go into uh, film and movies that have defined really what comedy is in the 20th century. And I've laughed at things they've done, I mean, a week ago, last week, right? I don't, I don't think that, the, and we go more into this on the Patreon with Ray just because it just happened. Um, coming out Thursday. Yeah, coming out Thursday. But it's never my intent to be uh, antagonistic to people. Now, I do attack them weekly, viciously, <laughs> truly. And it, it isn't my intent to be antagonistic. It's my intent to help. It's my intent to help, truly. And I mean, you may not believe that, but I, I would like the show to be better. I don't want to be on the show. I don't need their money. I'm okay. What I would like is to help. I want it to be better. It is, it is some of the things are, are good. Some of them could get better. I am just saying, hey, this is what it is. From one member of the media to another member of the media, Michael J., we're all members of the media, buddy. I don't know what you're talking about. Stand-up comedy, huh? It's the media. Go ask a 15-year-old. Go, hey, what's, who's your favorite stand-up? They'll say uh, Cody Co. Because Cody's a famous guy on the internet. The only things people really care about now are things that they can share with other people. And if you don't think my podcast is funny, or you don't, there are people that say, I love your stand-up. There's people that say, I love the podcast. There's people that love both. There's people that go, I don't like stand-up, but your podcast makes me laugh. Um, drawing lines around one kind of funny is weird to me. I've never looked at a writer and went, yeah, but, like David Sedaris writes a lot of funny books. I've never been like, yeah, but what are your views like? You don't do shit on Instagram. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. He's funny. There are people that are funny, right? Um, but that's that's really all I have to say about that. I ironically, uh, uh, I'm going to start submitting packets for SNL just for fun to see if uh, they'll hire me. I'm actually going to call my agent and ask him if there's a shot. Now they never do this, but is there a chance that they would hire me in the middle of the season? Rarely done, maybe never done. I don't know. Um, as a consultant and they could kind of bring me in to the writer's room and we could, uh, hash it out. The chances of that happening are very low. And I know that, um, but again, you know, not everyone's going to like you in this. Right. And I, I, and that's fine. Um, and, uh, not everybody's going to value the, the media empire that we've built here, the very wide reaching, influential media empire. It's a weird, it's a weird way to insult somebody by going like they're a, they're a media figure. I'm like, I thank you. I don't think so, but I appreciate it. Um, guys, confidence can take you far in life. It can also help you in the bedroom, especially when it comes to step up the plate, step up to the plate. That's where blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead. Be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. I love Blue Chew. Men everywhere are excited to see the postman. First impressions are important. What about lasting impressions? It's time to get off the couch and get back to work on fucking. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners, okay? Uh, Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code TD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's B L U E Chew.com. Promo code TD to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. This is a great way to support the show and support your dick. Do it! This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Tim Dillon Show listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Tim D. 
BetterHelp is great. Do you need help, but you don't want to leave your house and the help that you need may not be available to you in the places that you live? Well, you can start using BetterHelp, but it's not a crisis line. It is not a uh, self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available that may not be locally available where you live. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses from your counselor. And if you're not hitting it off with your counselor, you can transfer your counselor any time. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. They've got thousands of crazy good reviews. Better H-E-L-P. People have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Better H-E-L-P. They're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Better H-E-L-P. Get 10% off your first month. Tim D, baby, you know it. The the new movement now, that I got to take these. These headphones are like, this is, I love this, but this is real gas digital stuff. The headphones are kind of in and out. Let's try them again. Okay, they're better now. Okay. Lewis likes to keep everybody on their toes here. There's only, there's only, there's some real talent on the network for sure. Uh, but then there's always, I still call Lewis all the time. I go, there's a, a lot of shows have to go. <laughs> I, Because I, I still keep track of everything, you know? Ralph now is just running like 12 miles a day and no one cares. All Ralph does, Ralph is a co-owner of Gas Digital. All Ralph will do is like update. Everybody's like, I ran eight miles today in Midtown. Hey, Ralph, who gives a fuck? <laughs> like, we get it. You lost weight and you can run. We appreciate that. Just finished nine miles. I ran down by the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Hey, Ralph, cut it out. I just made roasted chicken in an air fryer, and now I'm going to run. We Hey, we get it. Good. Maybe he had a health scare. I don't know. Did Ralph have a health scare? Was that what this was about, Shannon? No, he just gained a bunch of weight, and then during the pandemic started running. Smart, because he's really made a change now. And uh, it'd be funny if you get hit by a car, <laughs> jogging, just healthy, just with the taste of Brussels sprouts still in his mouth. Um, yeah. So I wanted to talk about this article because I thought this was a very interesting article. This is a movement that I should know more about, and I don't know more about it. And it's called the anti-work movement. And this is a movement of people who are leaving the workforce for good. Not temporarily, not because they're, you know, uh, you know, taking a moment to regroup. These are people that are out. They're done. They don't want to come back. And that's kind of interesting uh, that they've had that epiphany over the last 12 months. And they've decided that it's not a specific job they don't like. It's any job. It's They don't want to do anything. And there's part of me that respects that. I can really kind of get into that. But then what do you do on like day three of that? It's, you know, day one and two were all planned out. And then day three, you start going, wait a minute. A lot of humans get self-worth from their job. I know that that is a terribly controversial thing to say now. Um, and I know that people think that if humans were freed from the need of having to work, then they would just be beautiful, magical creatures that would, you know, during the pandemic, everybody was like, well, if people didn't have to work, they would go out and start community gardens and they would do this and do that. And, okay, during the pandemic, everybody was off. I didn't see any community gardens. I didn't really see anyone planting anything. And I'm not saying people should work in these shitty conditions and not get paid and get ripped off, which is what's happening. And I'm not saying you should have this massive chasm between certain people that work and other people that work in terms of how much they get paid. But the idea that you could get rid of all work is interesting to me. I don't want to discount it immediately, but I know a lot of people that don't work and aren't doing well. And I don't mean just financially. I mean in every conceivable way. Friends of mine that don't work are on the internet all the time, way too much, almost as much as me, and it's my job. Um... They don't seem happier. They're not in better relationships because they don't work. 
They don't have better relationships with their family. They're certainly not planting any community gardens. They're not doing much in their community at all. Friends I know that don't work kind of become angry, paranoid people that spend all their time online figuring out why it is that they feel the way that they do. <laughs> this is my own personal experience. In the same way that friends of mine that work too much are also kind of anxiety-ridden, miserable people. So there's a balance. But let's talk about this article. It's interesting. There's a guy that moved. It's from a business insider. That's the rag that just ran that hit piece on Davey Portnoy. And they were going to run a hit piece on me. And one comic, this kid who was an open mic comedian who quit, then went to work for Business Insider, interviewed me. I was down in Florida. He called me. I spoke to him for an hour. You know, uh, you know the question, you know, Alex Jones and you did a podcast together. What was that about? <laughs> what was it like? What do you... You say some things that anger people. Why do you do that? What is it about? And I sat there in a parking lot smoking cigarettes, suffering through this interview because nobody asks any good questions. Really. Where are you from? <laughs> Were you always a contrarian? <laughs> Did you know Alex Jones when you were a baby? They're the worst questions ever because journalists are stupid. They're not, and they're not journalists. Journalists are people who have white hair and sit in libraries and look at microfiche and they try to solve the Kennedy assassination. Shannon knows we've had them on the show. They have no money. No one buys their books. No one cares. And they die alone and unfulfilled. Those are journalists. Or they go to like a war-torn country they run around that country. People shoot at them. They get some guy to give them some story at a cafe. They win a Pulitzer Prize. A year later, no one cares. They get diagnosed with cancer because they were too close to, like, live ammunition. And they die alone and unfulfilled. This is what journalists are. And then you have stenographers, meaning that they just write down things the government wants them to say. Those people have big houses. They're on TV a lot. They write books that are always put out there. They're in the front of the bookstore. And it's like, uh, it's just a picture of, uh, you know, God only knows, you know, Winston Churchill or FDR. And they're like, they wrote a, a history of him, which someone else wrote. They just kind of grabbed it. It's ghostwritten. They said, the greatest generation, you know, <laughs> Tom Broker, any of those guys. And their books are pushed because they don't make any trouble. They don't cause any problems. And they're, you know, and they lie, you know, like Brian Williams, the guy who just made things up and he lies. And they all lie because no one catches them. And lying is like a drug. You get intoxicated with doing it if nobody catches you. And that's so those are the, the class of journalists. And then you have these like New York media types who like write for these glorified blogs and they don't have any money and they eat ramen and they live on the floor and they have a, a degree from like Syracuse University or some other embarrassing school. Oh, the new house school of journalism is good. Who cares? Uh, or Columbia, which is an Ivy or whatever. And they're at, these people are so mad that they don't have talent. They're so, and, and so they love other people that don't have talent. So they love unfunny comedians. They love it. And they write stories like, who's the next biatch? Because they have no talent. And they go, where can I go to find people that like me are incredibly deficient in any noticeable skill. <laughs> and they find them and they go, these are 25 comedians that you're going to know. And they get in this little group of people and no one cares and they don't have any money and they get angry at people like Dave Portnoy uh, because he, he's, again, has a media operation and he's taking eyeballs away from people like CNN, uh, from uh, ESPN and bigger... Um, uh, platforms that are losing eyeballs to Barstool Sports. In the same way that our Patreons, like the number two in America, there are people that lose uh, eyeballs and ears or whatever to us because they enjoy this show. So the New York media types, and it's not, oh, and I don't mean Jews. And I don't, so don't tweet at me. And, <laughs> and because there's a lot of Christians doing this too, shamefully. 
and probably a few Scientologists. I'm kidding. The Scientologists are they they figured it out. Mm-hmm. But the New York media, because New York is the media capital of the world, these people are always they always have it out for people like Rogan and because these guys are threat. Independent operations are threats. They are big threats. That's why I don't run away from the media. You can call me media all day. I don't really care. Um, I think it's uh, funny media. If I am media, you just also have to be media sitting at a desk with a suit on working for NBC and the Saudi royal family. You also have to be considered media. If I'm media, you're media. We're all media, baby. So this comic calls me, what's it like to be you? And then I answer all the questions. Then I forget about it completely because I don't care about it. And Business Insiders is, uh, you know, is a rag. But we're going to talk about their anti-work article. But a lot of people have this article. The Guardian, whatever. This is the one that caught my eye. It's a rag. And they write inflammatory stuff like this article. is kind of like, no one's, there's a movement because this is meant to piss off people that are working. They write an article like this. You're like, nobody's working anymore. You are, sucker. And and Dave Portnoy is going to spit in your daughter's mouth tomorrow. Dave Portnoy's choking your daughter today. How does that make you feel? You got a wife? Well, Dave Portnoy's choking her. He's choking women in Nantucket. He's running around Nantucket, grabbing every woman he sees at the farmer's market and spitting down the throat. I mean, true. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be what's happening, okay? I did go to Barstool Sports, and he spit in my mouth. It was a bit, I think. It was a joke. I don't know. He spit in my mouth and said pig and then walked away. It was jarring, but not entirely unexpected, and it was somewhat enjoyable. He uh, has kind of proven they were after him. This comic calls me uh, the day the Portnoy stuff breaks, and he goes, hey, I quit Insider because they wouldn't run a hit piece on you. I don't know if you've wondered why the piece has never come out. And I said, I haven't wondered that because I don't care. I don't really know who you are. <laughs> and I, I was like the eating sushi parked in a handicap spot outside of Bristol Farms, and I was more concerned with that. And he goes, well, it didn't come out because they, they wanted me to run a hit piece on you. And I said, on me? They want to run a hit piece on me? And yes, they wanted to run a hit piece on me and say I was some reactionary, right-wing, lunatic, nut job. You know the way these people operate. So I'm not too shocked by what happened to Dave and what will happen to anyone if you have an opinion that runs counter. When everybody says the Covington kids should be uh, doxxed and you go, hold on, the facts are that the kids are standing there, they're getting yelled at by black Israelites, A guy walks up to them, starts beating a drum in his face. The kid just smiles. It's a pretty tame reaction, getting in a teenager's face. I can think of a lot of people that would have had a crazier reaction. The kid just stand there and smiled. And for that, the entire U.S. media wanted to ruin the kid's life to make a point. Okay? Now, the Rittenhouse thing's a little more complicated, but it's still clear that it was a self-defense, that he reasonably believed that his life uh, was threatened. That doesn't mean he should have been there with an AR-15. 17-year-olds that have no training should not be patrolling the streets with AR-15s. His mother is a psychopath. <laughs> My mother would not drop me off at the mall uh, if she was busy. This woman dropped her son off at a riot with a gun and was like, good luck, son. That is not good parenting. It's poor parenting. And the kid's a confused kid who wants to be a good kid, whatever that means in his head. By the way, people that join gangs want to be good people. People want to be good. They want to be, they want to have, uh, you know, they want to be like important and they want to serve a function. And that's why people join all kinds of groups. And that's why he said, I'm going to patrol the streets with these other yahoos. And this is why you can't have chaos and political violence in the streets all the time. And again, he's a media figure. This is media that he's doing. It's uh, common sense to say we shouldn't have people running around in the streets killing each other. (laughs) That is my controversial opinion of the week, (laughs) that we shouldn't. Now, people can get angry. No, it's more complicated than that. You're a psychopath. How dare you say that? I'm saying that no matter the reason... I don't believe the best course of action is to have people in the streets killing each other 
uh, and burning things down and rioting, there's a better way to do it. It's called civilization. It's a better way to do it. Okay? That's a dog whistle for white supremacy civilization. How dare you say it? But Rittenhouse is a nut. And please, and I, I've, uh, you know, we talked about this on the Patreon, but like the last thing I need is him getting off and then three days later on Twitter tweeting at me and taking my side in the Michael Che thing. Kyle, please do not. Please. I'm asking you for me selfishly take his side please take his side if you're going to take his side and it's over there are no there are no sides but you know if you have an opinion that runs counter to what people want the opinion people want you to have people just are going to get a, get angry at you upset call you names whatever so the anti work article is interesting this is uh from uh, insider great publication <laughs> And what does this say? What are people doing here? It says, inside the rise of anti-work, a worker strike that wants to turn the labor shortage into a new American dream. This is like the article that Bloomberg ran that said, hey, the stores don't have any stuff in them. Maybe that's good. <laughs> and you know, Bloomberg, the guy who runs Bloomberg is Mike Bloomberg, Billionaire. Look up Mike Bloomberg's net worth. It's like seventy billion dollars or more. This is the guy that ran for president. Uh, Fifty nine billion. Wow. Well, he's in the middle class. I forgot. <laughs> Fifty nine <laughs> billion dollars. He runs the publication, and Bloomberg is saying they have this article. You should find the article where it's basically like, "Hey, Americans may need to live like Europeans, and that's pretty damn cool." Maybe that's not the worst thing, that you go to the store and the, the shelves are half full. Yeah, supply chain shortages are constraining U.S. consumers' endless appetite for buying whatever they want whenever they want. It's about time. Yeah, like eggs. <laughs> the endless appetite for things. After all, Americans haven't always acted like this. We've entered an age of, of overabundance. We consume much more than we used to and more than other countries. So they're kind of shaming us into... Well, here's the deal. We absolutely consume too much. Mm. We're too fat. We eat too much. The houses are too big. Everything's too big. But the way to fight that probably is some type of spiritual renaissance where people realize that consumption in and of itself is uh, ultimately empty and hollow, and then they need to involve themselves in more meaningful activities where they can get more out of life. Uh, that's the hard way to do it and the sustainable way. Uh, just walking into a store and not having things <laughs> doesn't seem like a real... People are still going to consume just whatever they can find. These are also the people that go, uh, fat is great. You eat whatever you want, whenever you want it. And then they're like, maybe Americans should start living like Europeans. <laughs> well, you know what that means? Not being fat slobs. But I thought that was good. Fatness is good. It's not unhealthy. Don't think it. Being 500 pounds is healthy and great and beautiful. And everybody, well, how do you get to be 500 pounds? Consuming shit. So if you say, well, we should stop consuming, what do you mean by that? Do you mean Americans should stop buying treadmills? No, you mean that people should like, hey, how about one loaf of bread for the week for the family? That's kind of how I read it. You don't need all the new gadgets and gizmos. A lot of them food related. But it's weird to get this article from Bloomberg. It's weird to have a bunch of billionaires go, yeah, the stores are bare. The prices of gas is up. So just drive less. <laughs> hey, you can't afford gas? Maybe you should uh, don't go there, that place you want to go. Why don't you go to, hey, you want to go see your mother? See her less. It's very condescending and strange to tell people that they should adjust their habits when billionaires and people worth hundreds of millions of dollars have only gotten richer, have only bought more jets, have only bought more property, can only do more things, and people that aren't in that bracket can't do anything, and those people are told it's good. They, they tell people to go on long bike rides rather than just drive. because Go on a bike ride with your kids <laughs> on the highway. <laughs> Take your children on a bike ride. 
on the side of the road and go to the grocery store. It's good for you. Maybe you'll all die, and we could stop hearing your mouths. Whitney Webb's coming back on to talk about this, the Great Reset. And I know that uh, a lot of people have dismissed that as a conspiracy, and maybe parts of it are, but saying that this is uh, restructuring the economy is not a conspiracy. It seems pretty damn accurate. Read a paragraph or two of this article about what's going to happen in the world when nobody works. Well, this is a new lifestyle. The work-free lifestyle is what they call it. Great. A rising movement. I'm excited. <laughs> I've been living it for years. <laughs> so this is how it starts. It says, Larry had a vision. Shannon remembers when I used to have a job. I used to come in with a tour bus jacket from giving tours on a double-decker bus, and then I would come do the podcast. Shannon remembers that. Mm. And I would come in every day and think I had, like, a new disease, and I would Google, and i burn my mouth, and then I'd Google, like, sore mouth, and it would say, like, you have, you know, some, like, you know, a disease that's only transmitted by the South African baboon spider. And I'd be like, Fuck! Because I, work does make you lose your mind a little bit. So I'm in the middle here. I'm not crazy work, but I don't know if we, we you know, maybe we should do something. So this is how it begins. It says, Larry had a vision after he graduated college. He and his then wife were going to be a power couple. They were going to actualize their American dream. They'd buy a house in the suburbs and go on vacation every two years. That's not a power couple, Larry, you dumb fuck. The Clintons are a power couple. Jeffrey and Ghislaine are power couples. Mm. You just wanted to be ordinary, regular Americans. See, this is my problem with everything. Nobody questions anybody's premises. So immediately we're starting out with a guy who's probably crazy because he thinks a power couple is a couple that can afford coffee mm. in the suburbs. That is not true. If the article had started, Larry, when he graduated college, wanted to be a power couple. He wanted to grab a woman that he wasn't sexually attracted to, get married for money, rise through the ranks of the corporate world, and then eventually go into politics, all the while uh, participating in many nefarious activities, including uh, the rape, torture, and sacrifice of young children in order to build <laughs> loyal bonds with other members of said class. At that point, Larry and his wife would begin to redesign themselves as folksy nationalists who just cared about America, all the while going home and eating the flesh of children in his stew. That would make sense. So what did he want to do? He, he wanted to work and live in the burbs. Well, why wasn't he able to do that? Well, he was a maintenance technician in South Carolina. Okay. And, uh, so the vision of the perfect life eventually shattered. His, Where's his wife? Uh, she's from Colorado. Right, but keep reading. Okay. His then wife saw through the illusion of work, he said, and quit to take care of their children and her elderly father. It took him a little longer to get there. Uh, let me scroll down here. Uh, so now it says... Keep reading. When he got laid off from a seasonal job there, he moved back to South Carolina to be with his mother. Now he lives simply in a 20-foot trailer in the backyard. What about the kids and the wife? Uh, the kids and the wife. Uh, the ex-wife and children are in Colorado right now, it seems like. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about this is, like, you forget he has a wife and kids. Like, he's like, I just, I'm a simple man with simple pleasures. And I just go, and I want to live with my mother. It makes it sound nice, but he left his wife and children. Yes. yeah. He, and he's he, choosing to not support his kids. It seems that way. He's yeah. choosing to not support his wife and kids. And we, this was celebrated <laughs> as a new movement in work. And they're like, Gen Z has defined this new movement of giving the power back to the workers. No, it's called being a deadbeat dad. It's not a new movement. It's pretty fucking old. Ask Lewis about it. His dad got stabbed. That's not technically his fault. But his mom did smack. But his mom kind of raised him pretty well. Mm. For someone that was on heroin, she did like a good job. But my point is that being a deadbeat dad is not like a new thing. I read this article. They're trying to dress this up as like, this is a new revolutionary balance of power shift between employer and employee. This isn't a guy that unionized his job and got more benefits for people. This is a guy that said, I don't like my children and wife. I want to go live in a trailer and drink. Yeah, it says, I doubt he supports them because it says here, he says, I don't have any expenses. I don't need any money. I can survive without it. Right. I don't have any expenses. <laughs> Fuck those kids. <laughs> and they write about this like this is a great new thing. Living in a trailer with your mother is good. The article is written that this is good. <laughs> this is what they want. Understand who writes these articles 
they're they're dumb. They're journalists. They're idiots. But the people that own these publications put all this out for like a reason. They're like, it's good to not work. It's good to live in a trailer with your mother. It's great when you go to the grocery store and there's nothing there to eat. Now you're living like a European. Isn't this great? They ran that article in the beginning of the pandemic to go, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Isn't it great? You have nothing yeah. and you live with your mother in a trailer and your family is gone and you don't have any money to give them Christmas presents and fuck Christmas anyway. <laughs> That's some capitalist horseshit. You just stay in your trailer and every now and then wander to the grocery store. We'll give you a voucher for food that won't be there anyway. Isn't it good? Now you live like a European and Europeans don't live like that, by the way. Europeans work, not all of them, but like. They go to the cafe, they get food, they smoke cigarettes, they have sex, they don't like me too. So if you want to really be European, you got to stop with the horse shit. Women in Europe like getting thrown against a wall. That's a fact. As long as you have like a nice pasta dinner and everything, they enjoy it. France literally came out during Me Too and went, no, we don't do that here. We like Me Too. We enjoy it. Cut it out. We like fucking and not working. So in America, in this sexless, autistic horror culture that we've created, the only thing to do literally is work. We have a sexless, autistic, horrible culture that eschews any type of like family or bonds outside of work. So we're telling people don't have families, don't fuck each other, don't do anything, and also don't work. Well, Larry goes... I really don't want to work anymore. I don't want to have any meetings, no deadlines, no goals, no quarter, no seminar. I don't want none of that stuff no more. Oh, well, that sounds lovely. Maybe it's not good that we have a culture where people are just built to work, but if you want to start living like Europeans, understand that their culture is about family, which we don't fucking have. Mm. We take our elderly people, we throw them in nursing homes where people beat them. As soon as we're of age, we run away from our families. I know I did to get successful. In Europe, they live with their families. The family's a thing. The family name matters. People fuck and have children. In America, people have one ch child when they're like 40. Mm -hmm. The kid's a furry. The parents are like insane. That's not, that. then you gotta work. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? Go home and deal with your furry kid? Your kid who's a furry? And, you, and your kid's only a furry because you're working so much you don't even know what the hell's going on in their life. <laughs> so then you got to go back to work. You're like, I've already fucked this one up. This one's a furry. Yeah. In Europe, they're lazy, slothful people that enjoy life because they fuck and eat carbs. Go on for the rest of this article, Okay, so here, here's the retort from one moderator of the subreddit. He says, a lot of people mistake anti-work for being lazy and like nothing ever has to get done, says... Uh, rock cellist. Uh, but the truth of the matter about anti-work and everything surrounding it is that obviously things have to get done, but the current structure in which things get done and the way that capital flows as they get done is unfair and should be non-existent. Well, it's unfair, but the idea of it being non-existent is a bit of a stretch. I don't exactly... How exactly does that work? It's non-existent. Let's just get rid of it in favor of what? <laughs> right. What, what exactly would be... What exactly would be the other option, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's unfair, and I think there's ways to make it more fair. There's another person who left their job because they couldn't take out their phone. Yeah, yeah. so Cade, a Gen Z worker in Kansas, is one of the people who turned to r slash- Cade. Yeah, with a K. He turned to r slash anti-work and posted- after he quit his job as a service worker, he had been considering quitting for a while, but he was pushed over the edge after his boss posted a sign telling workers they couldn't use their phones during shifts. What? What a tyrant. By the way, I love these words. He was pushed over the edge because a worker said, get off your phone and work. Mm. Like a boss. A boss said, get off your phone and work. And he's like, this is, he thinks it's the grapes of wrath. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is uh, insane. I never really because he can't go a whole day without looking at furry porn. <laughs> He's watching furries fuck, and the boss is like, "Get, get him a coffee, or whatever." Kate says, "I never really see anybody not doing work and on their phone." He added, "He didn't think management should have the right to take his personal property." So then he started seeing posts from R slash anti work a few months ago, and that reading people's accounts of quitting and learning about the ways they're rethinking work factored into his own decision to quit. 
He's already had at least one interview for a new job and has a little bit of savings built up to keep him afloat in the meantime. Good for you, Cade. Cade, we stand with <laughs> Cade you. Cade says, I think it felt like I could be like a bigger part of a movement. <laughs> so this is, I mean, this really is a movement to these people. It's a movement. They're a million strong. Yeah, they'll be more than a million strong soon. They'll, <laughs> nobody will work. They'll, everybody will be. I just, I just love the idea of it. I love all these articles that are all coming out together. Work's bad. Because, by the way, work means you have money. Money means you don't have to listen to what the government tells you to do. Mm-hmm. That is no good. They don't want that. Mm-hmm. And if you question anything about the COVID thing now, you're treated like you've said, hey, did the Holocaust really happen? That's the response you get from people. People call me all the time. They go, I just got my booster. And I'm like, are you taking your mask off? They go, no. And I go, why? They go, well, it's not safe. And I go, well, you just got the booster. And they go, yeah, but you don't know how long that protection lasts. You can still get it. And you can still get very sick. You can still go to the hospital. And I go, right? Now? Do you understand how crazy you sound? They go, no. And I go, well, how many more boosters will you get? As many as it takes. For what? Like, there's no end goal, seemingly. There's no end goal here. This is the problem. I got vaccinated early on. Mm-hmm. I was like, hey, let's do it. Let's go back out. Who cares? Mm-hmm. COVID's a holocaust of fat people. Okay, I'll get vaccinated. I got vaccinated. Then they said, put the mask on. The vaccine doesn't do what we wanted it to do. And then they said, well, we never said that it stopped you from getting it. You did. You did. I have the receipts. You absolutely did. You also said that if you got it, it wouldn't even be symptomatic. It'd be very mild. That is not true either. Mm-hmm. We have those receipts. Then you said, well, you won't go to the hospital if you have it and you're vaccinated. I know people that have. And now the last thing is, well, you won't die. Don't you not want to die? It's like the last. By the way, this is your parents using everything on you. And then finally, the last uh, ditch effort of a parent who's like yelling at a kid usually is to go, some people die. Do you want to die? If I let you borrow the car, you're going to die. And you go, what? (laughs) Do you want to die? You go, no. So I'm not saying the vaccine is bad or that you shouldn't get it. What I'm saying is that I'm confused. And by airing these questions in public, I have drawn the ire of many. I'm confused as to what the end game is. Why do we have to keep taking a thing that isn't doing what we want and why mandate that people have it and fire people in mass if you can still get it and spread it. If vaccinated people have far less li- likelihood to go to the hospital with COVID and far le- and they're far less likely to suffer severe consequences from it, then the people that are vaccinated should be protected and not require everyone else to be vaccinated. Um, so it's weird to me, but if that isn't the case. And people that are vaccinated can still have all of those things happen. And all of th- and, and it's not really less likely. Viral load in vaccinated and unvaccinated people is kind of similar. An article just came out. I don't understand the rationale for the mandates, which are disproportionately affecting uh, black and Hispanic people that don't want to get the vaccine. Mm-hmm. Uh, as of the recent numbers, I don't know. Things may have changed. But... So I've questioned those two things. I've never said that all vaccines are bad. I never said it was aborted fetal tissue. I never said you were going to turn be a zombie mm-hmm. when a 5G, you know. Mm-hmm. But you're treated like that if you ask any of these questions. No, you're double vaxxed. You got both. Well, I'm fully, fully, fully vaxxed. vaxxed. Yeah, you got to both shots, yeah. And I'm and I had the COVID. Mm-hmm. So that should, you know. Twice. And I'm not saying that like everyone shouldn't get a booster. I'm going, what's the plan? I'm just asking questions. Hey. What are we doing? When do the masks come off? When do kids not wear masks in school? When are we? Because adults have gotten vaccinated and we're still wearing masks in many situations. Mm -hmm. So you go, well, if the kids are vaccinated, they won't have to wear masks. Well, why do I have to wear a mask? Shut up. That's. What did you storm the Capitol? (laughs) What? There's something weird, and there's something weird in people's eyes right now. It's a little Salem witch trials. Mm. It's a little Iraq War 2003. It's a little like, don't question what we're doing or you're going to be out. Mm. If you question anything we're doing, we're going to kill you 
And that to me is a little scary. Mm. And I've just said, hey, leave me be, let me live. Ship station, the holidays are the most wonderful time of the year, but if you're running an online store and you know they can also be the craziest, with everything's going on right now, you need to make sure that you're focusing on growing your business and not the back office stuff. You've got inventory to manage, orders to fill, and a growing list of stressed out customers checking in twice a day, wondering whether those last minute gifts will arrive in time. With ShipStation, the hassle of shipping out holiday orders melts away, leaving you with happier customers and more freedom to run your business or enjoy some much needed time off. Okay? I love ShipStation. The ease of how it is, it is easy to use, the money you save. I love it. I have friends that use it, they run online e-commerce businesses, they use ShipStation, and they never have to worry about anything. My friend almost got hit by a car because she was so not worrying about anything. If you sell anything online, I don't need to tell you that shipping can be super frustrating. So many carriers, ton of factors that go into figuring the best rate for each order. Easily import orders from every sales channel, whether it's Amazon, eBay, Etsy, or your own website, and automate just about any shipping task. From one easy-to-use dashboard, changing your shipping solution can seem daunting. With the holidays here, now it is time to think about making a change. Make this holiday season a little brighter with ShipStation. Use my offer code Tim Dillon to get a 60-day free trial. Just enough time to handle the holiday rush. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top, Enter the code Tim Dillon. Make ship happen. I love being safe at home. Do you? Do you? I, I do. I use this. Simply Safe. Ben uses it. Mm -hmm. We use it. I have it. Simply Safe is great. They install indoor and outdoor cameras. <laughs> Why'd you laugh? The way you said camera. 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 Cameras. Comprehensive sensors, all monitored around the clock by trained professionals who send help. The instant you need it, Simply Safe was even named the best home security system of 2021 by US News and World Report. You can easily customize the system for your home in minutes. Even get free custom recommendations from Simply Safe. These are Simply Safe's biggest discounts of the year. You can get a complete home security system starting at just over $100. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. There are no long term contracts or commitments. It's a really easy way to start feeling a bit more peace of mind. Take advantage of Simply Safe's holiday sale and get 40% off your new home security system by visiting simplysafe.com slash Tim Dillon. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash Tim Dillon for 40% off your entire system. Hurry, this offer ends soon. Please. What other articles did you bring up? Uh, uh, Gislaine. Gislaine Gislaine's is getting, trial yeah. starts today. Mm. Now, Gislaine may be guilty. I don't want to believe that. <laughs> I don't want to jump to a conclusion, <sighs> but it is harder and harder to ignore the mountains of evidence that suggest that Ghislaine Maxwell, and I mean, folks, it pains me to say this. I don't even want to say it. It pains me to say it. There is evidence that suggests that Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were running a child trafficking <laughs> ring for very wealthy and powerful people and members of the government. Mm. I've just started to accept that this may have been what's happening. Also, it's possible that Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, that he was killed, so that he would not reveal any of the people participating in said trafficking ring. Because, by the way, what I'm doing now is a joke. This is what the media will do in a few months. The media will do this. The media will go, in what is seeming to be a new development, evidence is pointing to the fact that Jeffrey and Ghislaine were running a trafficking ring. And then they're going to have to say, because if this is a real trial, which it may not be, there's speculation that Epstein was an asset, was an intelligence asset of Israel and the U.S. or whatever, some hybrid. Maxwell's father was a Mossad agent, um, widely known, book about it by Seymour Hirsch, I believe. Um, and what the media is going to have to do is they'll, they'll have to kind of do that with a light touch. They'll be like, speculation, it has been said 
that perhaps this was some type of blackmail up. And they, they all have to pretend like they don't know what any of it means. They're like, people are saying this is potentially a blackmail operation, that they would um, compromise these powerful people and videotape them doing things that are heinous and immoral and illegal and then hold that over their head to gain control over them. This is what's being said. We don't, we don't have any confirmation of this. We're not. But that's what it is. It's the media's job. The media's job is to pretend uh, to be discovering things that peop you've known for years. So that you'll know something for years and then the media goes, it's perhaps what you think. And you go, yeah. But Lady Ghislaine, she's complaining about being in jail. She says a rat sits next to her on the turlet. Mm -hmm. She says uh, that uh, she's watched in the shower by prison guards and had a rat pet. She had a rat for company. It is strange um, her falling from grace, going from uh, where she was to the Brooklyn Detention Center. Mm. You got to think, because this is a woman who was literally friends with kings and queens and presidents, and she really lived that life. She was the real housewife of human trafficking. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Just a big goblet of white wine, <laughs> pimping out hoes to prime ministers. And now she's rotting in a jail cell. Uh, and She's the, eating rotten food. They're giving her rotten food. Well, she says. <clears throat> yeah, apple with maggots in it. They're leaving the lights on, so she hasn't like been in the darkness in like months and months. Well, she is uh, used to quite a different mode of living, mm -hmm. right? And it's uh, she's not exactly somebody who can just make an adjustment, which I think is inhumane to have her in a jail cell like this. I think you should put her in a hotel a five-star hotel, mm -hmm. hot coffee, marble bathroom, heated towels, slippers, give her the internet. Let her live a little. Mm -hmm. She just wants a fair trial. She told the newspaper, I'm terrified the overwhelmingly negative coverage will poison my jury pool and affect the outcome of my trial. Despite well, I will be honest. <laughs> that is true. Many people have made their minds up about her already. I, I can't deny that that is very possible. People hear her name, and there's an image that comes into their mind. Mm. And it is an image of someone who's done the wrong thing. Um, but she'll have a trial, and I don't, I don't know how fair it'll be. I don't know how much they're going to let come out. She's not going to roll. People think she's going to roll. She's not going to roll. Mm -mm. She knows if she rolls and gets out, it's all over for her. Right. And it's over for her family. This is the way the intelligence world works. It's not only you it's your family, it's anyone you've ever cared about, mm. right? She had a husband, this guy, Scott Borgensen. They lived in New Hampshire. Mm. Look up this guy. They got married. He's acting like he doesn't know who mm. she is. Oh, yeah, Scott Borgensen. Oxford, mm -hmm. socialite, business person. He now is, like, denying that he knows who Ghislaine Maxwell is. Yeah, it says maybe he's a fake husband. Is he? Has he been invented? No, he's real, and they were together, mm -hmm. and then he was like, wow. <clears throat> yeah, an article two weeks ago says he, like, disappeared. Yeah, well, he's he's being, like, hounded by the press, mm -hmm. and they're like, hey, man, what's going on with your wife? And he doesn't, you know. Imagine that. Imagine being like, yeah, my wife's having some problems. And like, what is it? She's sick? Well... She's Ghislaine Maxwell. Mm. And they discovered Ghislaine on that estate. Get up that house in uh, New Hampshire she was in. Because what a beautiful piece of property she was in. We, we don't know if we want to see her get out or not. We want to see her get out if she'll do the show. She seems hopeful like she'll just go back to her New Hampshire home like nothing ever happened. She wants Part to of me wants to see that. Part of me wants to see it. There it is pretty no she'll she's gonna get convicted 
and she'll probably spend the rest of her life in jail or she'll get killed or whatever. It's called Tucked Away, her retreat. It's a sprawling $1 million retreat. It's nice. It's beautiful. And that's where they picked her up and they brought her to mm. the Brooklyn Detention Center. And who is her lawyer? Who is representing Ghislaine Maxwell? Who is... Is it a high-powered... Is it a woman? I think it should be a woman. It should be, right? I hope. We want Ghislaine to have a fair trial and have a good uh, chance of getting off. Apparently, it's a guy who represented one of uh, Bin Laden's associates. Not a great look. His name is Sternheim. He's a trial lawyer. Listen, I told you. Bin Laden was clean. And this bitch is also clean. I think she needs a woman. But you know what? It's probably hard to get people to take the case. Mm. It's probably difficult to get people to take... It's a hard... Because you really got to yas queen it up. Oh, it is. It is a girl. Bobby Sternheim is a girl. Yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah, nice. Google Bobby Sternheim. You need to yas queen it up. You need to be like, this bitch was told a tale. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> well, 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 well. Bobby Sternheim is a woman, uh, perhaps... But she is a tough bitch. She looks like one of the prison guards at the detention center. <laughs> yeah. But in order to win this case, if I if I was Bobby Sternheim, I would have to cut. You got to go up in her opening statements and be like, you know, men, they lie. They tell you things that aren't true. And you do. You've ever been strung along by a man. Who tells you he loves you, but he just wants to fuck kids and blackmail the president. You know, oldest story in the book, <laughs> men. Men out there lying. And this young, inexperienced daughter of a uh, media mogul who was a sweet, young, innocent flower, mm -hmm. didn't know the ways of the world. Yes, she was practically royalty. Yes, her father owned a, 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 a massive media empire, but so do I. So this poor, young, country farm girl, Ghislaine Maxwell, this unsophisticated British woman, gets caught up and influenced under the clutches of this... Uh, figure jeffrey epstein the lawyers are calling it the halo effect it is the halo effect and he surrounds himself with people who would serve his needs he surrounds himself with all these people now this young unsophisticated it almost seems like for her to get off they have to turn her into something she's not mm. it's almost like she might rather just die being a villain than having to be this useful idiot this dupe we have to convince the jury that you're a moron that jeffrey so what you get another few years before your tit falls off and you have your cancer anyway. It's like, I get it. You want to really go out like that? You want to convince the jury that you're some idiot dupe who had no idea what was going on, that you were taken advantage of? I mean, that's the story they're going to have to sell. Yeah, That's the narrative that they're going to have to sell. This man took advantage of a good woman. It's happened before and it'll happen again. You know, Bobby Sternum, Stein and whatever. Sure, her voice is quivering and she's scaring the jury and her... Her voice, you know, she's got her disgusting hot coffee breath yelling at them. I just hit these men. They're robbing women and, and of their lives. And you got to gotta get the jury frothed up in a real, like, fuck Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey's a liar. Jeffrey told her things that weren't true. He said he wanted to film fitness videos on that island. He's a liar. And Lady Ghislaine, well, what the hell was she supposed to do? We wish her the best. <laughs> Will they do a Ghislaine Maxwell sketch on SNL? Mm. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Maybe they will. Shout out to everyone at SNL. We're, we're, we kid. We love you all. Mm. We wish you the best. 
All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. From the Gas Digital Studio, we thank the great Shannon. Shannon, we love you. Shannon, you're a great woman. We appreciate all your work. Who's that other broad? Natalie. Natalie. Hello. Natalie, thank both of you for doing everything. You built this show, Natalie. You built this show. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> you built this program, and we, uh, we appreciate it. We started here at Gas Digital, and when we're thrown off the internet and finally canceled, <laughs> we'll probably end it here, too. All right. Good luck, everybody.